Welcome to How to Make It in the City on WBAI in New York 99.5 FM. This is a show where we explore both the practical and spiritual aspects of making it. This show is for artists, entrepreneurs, dreamers, and visionaries who are determined to end the cycle of working soul-crushing jobs just to pay bills. This is where we learn how to live our mission while making a great living. This is where we learn how to do well by doing good. This is where we learn how to step into our divine calling while entering a space of financial freedom and abundance. I am your host, Ama Kari Kari Yawson. In August of 2015, I quit my six-figure salary day job as a corporate lawyer to step into my purpose of healing through storytelling. I now travel the country performing my stories, such as my debut book, Sune's Gift, while facilitating presentations and training sessions for schools, universities, governments, and corporations. Loved ones, it has been quite a bumpy ride, and I have a long way to go. Let's figure out how to make it in this city together. Welcome, loved ones. So for today's show, we are going to discuss the issue of how to rise up after a setback so you can achieve your dreams. So how do you overcome a setback? Life inevitably has its ups and downs. We have moments of seeming defeat and moments of tremendous victory. But after we have experienced what we perceive as a defeat or a blow, how do we rise up so that we can set ourselves on a path for success? What are the steps? What spiritual work is necessary? What do we have to do to change our mindsets? And what do we physically have to do in order to rise up? To help us with this question, we have two great guests who will help us answer those questions. Our first guest is a John Maxwell certified coach, and her name is Winnie Benjamin. Winnie Benjamin holds a degree in clinical nutrition from Mr. Cordia University. She is also a certified holistic consultant, lifestyle consultant, and coach. For 30 years, she has been passionate about helping others in the United States, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, and West Africa find their purpose and identify their talent. Today, A number of them are members of the Unstoppable Society of individuals that are excelling in all areas of life. These individuals, along with Winnie Benjamin, are well prepared for the awesome and exciting era of new opportunities. We welcome you to How to Make It in This City. How are you, Coach Winnie Benjamin? Oh, I am great. I am great. Emma, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you on your platform today and uh, looking forward to adding value to our audience. Absolutely, absolutely. We are grateful to have you here. So please just tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a life coach. Well, let's say uh, (laughs) it's somewhat an interesting one and in essence of time, I'm going to make it totally brief as possible. (laughs) Well, as I was growing up and going through college, I was not aware of the significance of coaching. Mm. I thought only athletes and vocal performers needed coaching. (laughs) So I always had this affinity to business and not having the right guidance entered a nutritional program of which later on I had no desire Mm. to make it a career. And it really hurt me because, as you know, you spend time and lots of money, and I've come to realize that I'm not in the minority, but the majority of individuals entering into school, uh, spending money, spending time, coming out to find out that that is definitely not their calling. So anyway, uh, what I realized that my passion was, but not having the right guidance, 
was has always been business. As a child, I remembered in hindsight that I that I've always desired business, and in hind, in hindsight, I should have pursued it in school. So after school, I made several attempts to enter business, of which I did and wanted to scale and crash consistently and having no idea why. And that, to me, was very depressing. Hmm. So in my determination uh, to succeed, I diligently searched for answers, which I found in self-help books, business books, YouTube, live seminars, and even workshops. It was in that pursuit, Amma, that I discovered that coaching is not only for athletic and vocal performance, but for those having career, business, lifestyle challenges. And, uh, you know, that was an eye-opener for me, a big, big eye-opener. It is then I discovered the significance of having significance, or I should say, you know, having a significance of the having the significance or understanding the significance of having excellent mentoring and coaching and the needlessness of losing time and heavy financial losses. Mm. So after engaging in a number of coach, um, basically I engaged a number of coaches for myself, and I must say today, Blissfully, I'm satisfied today with my current life's journey. I decided I can now reach back and help others to reach their ultimate good at a faster pace, hence becoming a transformational coach. And to that journey and to that end, I entered into the John Maxwell uh, Certified Leadership Coach and Mentoring Program. And today I'm now certified to work with leaders. And uh, they more... Importantly, as the visionaries, like myself, we need it most. It is critical for us to survive. And so, in a nutshell, that's my journey. Wow, what a beautiful path that you've told us about. So now, because the theme of today's show is how to rise up after a setback, tell us about some of those business setbacks that you experienced or even some setbacks that you experienced when you decided to become a life coach. Mm. Okay, setbacks. I could write volumes, but <laughs> again, in <laughs> essence of time, let's make it a presentation here, right? So mm-hmm. attempting to succeed without a coach and a mentor, I lost unbelievable time, money, and trust of friends and family, the most emotionally devastating experience I ever had. Because, you know, you, you get to a point of maturity, of understanding the value of friendship, the value of friends, and being that I understand how collaboration is key and the collaboration of trust is key. Entering into business and not really understanding that dynamic, and I end up losing that trust. No more are they loaning me the money. So, so no tell me, so what, what business, mm-hmm. what business, Coach Winnie, what business were you doing that they're loaning you money and they're giving you this trust and you felt oh. like you were losing out and um, uh, needlessly? Give us some, some more okay. granularity. So let's, let's even go back. I mean, I know mm-hmm. you. The, 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 the theme is in on my coaching, but before I got into yes. the coaching aspect, I went into business. I wanted real estate, so loan me the money to buy this first piece of property. Okay. <laughs> That went down. That did good. I remember uh, in college I started Mary Kay, and I did phenomenally well with that. Mm. And my father came in as an investor in buying the inventory for me, and I was doing well, Mm -hmm. and the goal was to pay him back. Instead, I did well and did not pay him back, Uh (laughs) you know? And then uh, it's a whole long story where that went into um, into Aspen. There were so many different businesses that I got into where, I mean, the list is so huge, you wouldn't hold your mouth if I tell you, but I was, I managed to convince friends and family to loan and get me into, you know, these programs. And then it failed. So anything new that I was going to come stepping to them with thereafter, you can imagine what I was going through, some all alone at this point. As a matter of fact, that was one of the pathways of why coaching became such a desire for me, you know, because it, it, is, it is just devastating. Anyway, how did I make the comeback and the setbacks? <clears throat> sure. I really, in coaching, 
let's put it in this way. And since I made that my career as a um, a mentor, a leadership coach and mentor, which is now my focus, uh, I, I stumbled there as well because I believe because of the setbacks and the pain and the and and the feeling that I was not helped, I jumped to help individuals. The minute they ask a question, I started pouring out advice to them. And even though I was trained as a coach, as, no, as a matter of fact, I was not trained as a coach at that point. I just went into coaching unprofessionally. So I just thought coaching was giving advice. Mm-hmm. Found out, no way. And I was hitting a deadlock, gridlock. And when I went for the certification is when I found that coaching is definitely not advising. Mm -hmm. It is just understanding the theme, the key point that that person uh, is looking forward to, and then ask them intentional leading questions that lead their own mind, leading their own thoughts. Mm-hmm. helping them to block out all of the different noises and confusion and bring because they have the answers within them. And it's after doing that that the success began. It's right after doing that that the success began. And what I did to even help me during the disappointing times before that happened, I kept my dream before me. I knew I needed to help people because I knew how I was suffering, and I swear I didn't want anyone going down that road. So my having massive faith in God and his principles for success, that's why I think that I was able to hold that dream in front of me and not doubt that it was called of God for me. So in his proven and sustainable advice kept me afloat until I got the principles locked in my head. That means the sustainable principles that he had, right? And by applying them to uh, my daily practices, I was good to go. Okay. Enjoying the journey. Let me me try to uh, summarize or to get some key nuggets out of what you just told us about your own life. So... Mm -hmm. After devoting time, energy, and money to a degree in nutrition, you realized this was not your calling. You went into business. But for the most part, with the businesses you, that you were pursuing, real estate, Mary Kay, etc., you were not achieving success. And not only were you not achieving the success that you perhaps had wanted to, you were losing the faith of friends and family. And you oh, believe Lord. part of that, a part of the challenge was that you did not have the right coaches so for example you say that your father helped invest in your mary Kay business he gave you a loan but you weren't you know responsive in paying that loan back perhaps Mm -hmm. if you had had a coach the coach would have we're not going to use the word advise because you say coaching is not about advising Mm -hmm. coaching is Mm -hmm. rather about asking intentional questions that elicit that person's own internal answer so perhaps if you Mm -hmm. had a coach asking you intentional questions about your relationship with your father about doing business you would have come to a different conclusion and you would have been more responsive in paying back the loan and you would have made fewer mistakes would you say that's an accurate uh, summary absolutely of- and before the coaching because of how young i was mm-hmm. i needed mentoring okay okay it is a difference between the mentoring and the coaching since coaching does not teach and coaching does not advise Mm -hmm. If you don't have the information already in your head, then your coaching is not going to be successful. So you need the mentoring, which is the teaching, the success principles. You need to understand that. So surrendering to right mentoring, mentoring towards the field that you want to enter and and, and being advised about the traps that you, you need to be aware of. You know, uh, for example, the tendency that you're going to borrow the money, you're going to start the business. The challenge is you didn't prepare well. Mm. You didn't have a business plan. You just had the idea. And even though you bought into whether it's a franchise or in a network marketing system where a system is already in place, you still need a personal plan. So that if you choose to borrow the money, which was not part of the principles, let's say with Mary Kay, you did not have to, but I chose to. But then if I chose to do that, if I, if I did that, then I should have a plan. What is the money for? 
Yes. How are you, you see, what is, how are you going to pay it back? Are you planning to live on that money that you make or that money is just going to go back into the business? Do I have those questions? So, yes, coaching at that point would have asked those questions. It's not going to tell me what to do, but those were the questions that should have been asked of me. Okay. So now, now you say that this experience of going into these various business ventures in your young age and not achieving the success that you desired and then finding some sort of, I would say, uh, some sort of answers to the questions through YouTube, through reading, through self-help books and so forth allowed you to realize that coaching and mentoring are necessary and in that process you became a certified coach yourself. So now tell us please, in your coaching business now, now that you've changed your profession from just being an entrepreneur in various areas such as Mary Kay or real estate and what have you, to actually coaching people who are business leaders and visionaries, please tell us, what exactly are the most common setbacks that your clients are experiencing? This is following the same footsteps that I had. Okay. You have a vision in your mind. You see it and you jump at it. You want to go from where you are and seeing the vision and get to the point of execution towards the end. Looking for the end result and paying very little attention to where you are and are you fully equipped to take that journey? So that tends to be missing. And so by getting a coach, because the idea, especially for visionaries, and I'm a heavy visionary, I have the idea, I'm passionate, and I want to see the end result. And we tend to just annihilate any and everything around us, including those who are even trying to advise us. So that, I got it, I got it, I got it. And that's the mistake, and it's expensive. What I've discovered is that it caused a setback. And remember I started to say that that's what started and what do you do? You lose the friends. And the, But when you're now a business owner and you're a visionary, let's say you already started in business and now you're ready to move or scale, you need that collaboration. And now who are you going to collaborate with after you have already destroyed their trust in you? Okay, so let me let me summarize for our listeners. One of the major setbacks that your clients who are entrepreneurs and visionaries experience is the setback of basically being so concerned, so passionate, so singly focused on the vision and not on the actual steps and granular action items that they dive in to business without the necessary preparation as to what it is they are going to do. And in that process, they wind up losing the confidence of friends and family members who invest in them. And as a result, find themselves feeling, and perhaps not just feeling, being all alone. <laughs> is, is, oh, is that what you're seeing? Really be alone. Being oh, alone. absolutely. Okay. You're going to be alone because what happens Part of the success journey usually requires, not usually, but it does require putting a team together first. Mm -hmm. So I have the vision. The next thing I ought to do is pull the team together, the team in different specialization, and then help them to create the mission. I have the vision. The team create the mission. At times, we are the visionary, and we are also the missionary. We are the ones creating the vision, the mission, and it might work as a, when you're doing a pilot program, but not when you're trying to really build an income-sustainable business. You have to start looking for that team. And that's a whole different conversation on how you actually form the team. But I wanted to say, uh, uh, answer a little bit more to the question you asked me. And uh, that is the time and money that you lose in that process is painful. But here is where the pain is even greater. You, many times, as you know, in business, you find a need and you fill it. So the vision and the passion to answer the need and the, and the challenges of your target market and not doing it the right way, those people suffer because you couldn't get to them because your business crashed in the process of getting to them. 
that's painful. Okay. That's painful. Okay. You know, so you lose the, the, you know, you just couldn't build a sustainable service in the market faster. You couldn't get to market fast enough to meet their needs. And I believe every entrepreneur and visionary must realize that that's a key point. Who are you serving? And how urgent is it for you to get to them and their challenges? Can you afford to stumble on the way? Sure, because many, many entrepreneurs are not well capitalized. And so in the time okay. that they are, as you would say, stumbling and trying to figure it out, they still have to feed themselves. Those monthly yes. bills are still coming in. And so if they're not okay. able to achieve that sustainable revenue base and that sustainable profitability in time, it doesn't matter that there are hundreds of thousands or even millions of consumers who would love mm. that product or love that service. Mm. Because in the end, when they can't feed themselves, they give up, they go get a job and it's all done mm-hmm. and those mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. or millions of people never are able exactly. to uh, access the, the product or the solution. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, so please tell us. I think you've given us some nuggets about how we overcome the, the setback that you've described. You've said that you mm-hmm. have to uh, build a team. You, you create the vision, but you build the team. And with the team, you create the mission. Can you give us some more details about that? What are the other steps? What exactly do they do? There are many entrepreneurs listening to this show. Many people who have dreams of becoming entrepreneurs in 2018 and they desperately need to know what exactly they can do to make sure they're on the path to success well first of all i would recommend that the visionary and the entrepreneur get involved in what's known as masterminding and the mastermind programs that they get into must be tailored to exactly what they're trying to achieve. Sometimes they may not know. So that's where the coach could or mentor in that time would say to them, listen, I'm going to suggest before you even get started, enroll in a mastermind program because you need to find a team. And in that mastermind program, it's also going to test you depending on the program you're involved in. For example, uh, a merchant group that I'm affiliated with, I'm starting for them in January. Put your dream to the test. That's one of our John Maxwell mastermind programs. So you have this vision and you have this dream, but let's test it out before you even think about spending time and money doing anything else. So you enroll in a mastermind program whereby you can go through that testing process with other like-minded individuals. And what are you looking for? Not are you learning about yourself and say, wait a minute, I didn't know it was going to be this tough. So I think I need to throw that out. It's really not my dream anyhow. It belongs to someone else. Why don't I quit? And then you save yourself some money. But let's say you go through all the 10 rigorous questions in putting that to test, uh, that dream to a test, along with like-minded, maybe eight or nine individuals like-minded, and they're battling it out. Some are falling out and some are staying through it. Not only are you learning for yourself, but you are watching the character of the others within the team. And you say to yourself, you know what? I like Joe at the way he shows up. I like the fact he's a listener. I notice the coaching. You know, he's coachable. I'm seeing these attributes about him that I like. Let me put him into my pocket, in my coffer. And you are constantly looking for the characteristics of the individuals that you need to put on your team without having to get them, go to a lawyer, pay money to put a bit, uh, uh, what you call it, um, uh, a partnership contract together only to go back to the lawyer and say we need to pay you to break it up sure so you now see? please people so, listening are like what is a mastermind and how do i get in a mastermind so please answer okay. that question for them okay so the mastermind is basically a teaching or mentoring process where maybe for the it's usually about an hour and uh you know the first 10 minutes the facilitator will teach a particular subject you know, like uh, everyone communicates, few connect, or uh, the speed of trust. So the 10 minutes of teaching, everyone pr- pretty much will have a book and a workbook. So they are already reading, you know, the exercises. And they do the 10 minutes of teaching. And thereafter, all the facilitator is doing is asking key leading questions to the team. And they are responding. So it's constant dialogue on that particular subject that they're studying, which might be, Everyone communicating, 
but we are not connecting. And it really teaches you in that process of reading it from the, from the book and through the teaching exercise, oh, my God, I'm really not connecting to my staff. I'm not connecting to the person whom I thought understand what it is I'm trying to do. You see, so that's what masterminding is in its in its nutshell, but more. And how do people join such a mastermind? Well, they are usually all over. In my in in my situation, I offer that service. They only have to contact me, okay. and I can get them enrolled because I'm doing a series of them for 2018. Okay, so well, an that's individual perfect. can bring me in to form to facilitate a mastermind with them and their friends. Okay. So I can come on their team to do it. Well, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. Please tell our listeners how exactly they can get in contact with you because many of them might be interested. How do they follow your work? How do they connect with you? Okay. First of all, uh they can you know, they can actually email me at Winnie at stewardshipmasters.com, and stewardship is like the steward, S-T-E-W-A-R-D-S-H-I-P. That's basically one word, but in the email, it's basically stewardshipmasters with an S, M-A-S-T-E-R-S, dot com. Or they may find me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash I-N forward slash Winnie Benjamin. And they can also visit my main site at stewardshipmasters.com. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Is there any other parting advice you might want to give to our entrepreneurs listening who are hoping that as a new day comes, as a new era comes, they achieve success and that they rise up from the setback? Any other words? Yeah, right now, I don't think I could urge any more into to or I should say plead with individuals, get yourself a coach now. The world has changed thanks to technology. Every 90 days, something has changed. So, the, you know, they, we used to have what you call our 12-month strategic planning process. Mm-hmm. You've got to hold that loosely because every 90 days there is a disruption and you have to be extremely flexible and loose to be able to switch to the left if you have to switch to the right and that could be very confusing so only a coach specializing specializing in this market or a business performing service that you that could help you navigate this volatile world. We're dealing with diversity. The world, the global world is getting small. You're going to deal with various cultures within a specific environment. And here is the key point. Self-governance and self-organization is the new norm in business, in a, not business structure, but business organizational structure. You're not going to talk about the top leaders anymore and let me pass this up line. The team will come together without a job description. They're coming together with a role. So today, this is your role. Tomorrow, this is going to be other roles. So these individuals working in a cell, self-governance towards the very vision and the mission of the company, but in this little organized cell, they're working on a particular project, but anyone from that project could come and work in another project. So no one is saying, well, that's not my job description. That's out with the water now. So individuals need to be trained and be prepared for this new form of hiring to companies. And just so that they get a little idea of what that looks like, let them go to Zappos.com and look at Zappos, that's Z-A-P-P-O-S, and see the new organizational way that Zappos is now running and and a few other companies that are already on, on board with that. And it's, it's speed. It is the speed in how your company is going to survive in this 21st century. I think that is a perfect note for us to end this session. We are so grateful to you for your time, your energy, your wisdom. Thank you so much, Coach Life Coach Certified John C. Maxwell, Life Coach Winnie Benjamin. Please, please contact her if you need her. We are going to take a musical break now. Thank you. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. You can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out. Move mountains, we gon' walk it out and move mountains. 
Welcome back. You're listening to How to Make It in the City on WBAI in New York City, 99.5 FM. You just heard Andre Day's Rise Up. We just heard from life coach Winnie Benjamin on the topic of rising up after a setback. We are grateful for her words of wisdom. Now for our second half, we have Mr. John Garland. In 2007, John Garland founded Click Clicks Media Group, LLC, which is a full service agency offering planning and execution of marketing and communications, creative media, direct marketing, research, public relations, promotions, and events to its clients in order to reach African American, Latino, and local urban markets. The group's clients include Google, Boost Mobile, United Healthcare, American Dental, Def Jam Recordings, and a number of other well known companies. But before John Garland became a successful marketing and communications entrepreneur, he actually experienced one of the most challenging setbacks that anyone can experience. He was incarcerated. He is here to share his story of rising up after a setback. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome, John Garland. Thank you for having me, Alma. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Now, I actually, in the interest of full disclosure, know John Garland because I'm one of his clients. His media group printed my lawn signs when I was running for office and did a number of other media and communications work so I can stand by his work and it was a phenomenal working relationship. So please tell us about your upbringing. Please tell us about your early years. Well, my early years, um, I was raised in the South Bronx um, during the late 70s and early to mid 80s when things in the South Bronx were really bad. I mean, in t- you know, socially, economically, um, our, our borough was a disaster. You know, the neighborhood was peppered with abandoned buildings and there was fires every night. There's several times during my, you know, uh, growing up in the South Bronx, I remember getting those midnight knocks or those late night knocks on the door where somebody's saying that the building's on fire and, you know, having to scramble out and grab my brothers and sisters and my mom is yelling for my, you know, 
for, for everybody to get out the building. And, you know, this happened several times growing up, um, you know, in the wind, mostly in the winter time. Um, you know, we had to do the the shelters and the welfare hotels and uh it was it was a pretty rough time it was really really rough now what exactly was the situation of your parents well my mom uh i learned later in life that she had been uh diagnosed with schizophrenia um she had grew she was raised uh a, a lot of you know a majority of her childhood she grew up in uh, Kings Park Psychiatric Center um this was during the uh mid and and late 50s um when you know they didn't even have thorazine and haldog and other psychotic medications that uh put a, that closed down a lot of those hospitals but Kings Park was one of the largest psychiatric centers um on Long Island and at the time they were supposedly like ahead of the game in 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 uh psychiatric um treatment um so my mom had been subjected to uh you know shock treatments and uh even a partial lobotomy hmm. and um i think it was 1955 um thorazine was invented and um, a lot of the patients who were inmates in the psychiatric hop- hospitals all across the state, from Pink Kings Park to Matawan, um, they started, you know, letting them out and and um, prescribing them to psychotropic meds like Thorazine. And I guess my mom had been one of the patients. Um, she was underage. While she was underage, she had two sets of twins. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, one set of twins and my and my oldest brother. Um, so she basically was under medication while she was in the psychiatric hospital and impregnated, you know, possibly by staff. And Wow. Um, so this is a teenager. Yes. Because you said she wasn't she wasn't even 16 yet, you said? Yes, she she had um she she, she had she had babies way early. Well, she the, while well, she was in the hospital. While she was in the hospital. Yes. So this is someone who grew up in a mental institution was potentially impregnated because you're not sure who the father is mm-hmm. by one of the staff members or another inmate. Mm-hmm. And so three of your siblings literally were born in a mental institution. Yes. Okay. And so this was your mother's circumstance, which obviously is extremely challenging. What about your dad? Well, my biological father, he passed away when I was uh, relatively young, uh, five years old. Um, I I was raised by my stepfather Richard, who my mom met sometime after she had signed herself out of the uh, psychiatric center, and she came to Harlem with uh with her aunt, and um she was introduced to heroin, and you know I guess she she started self medicating. She you know got I guess the thorazine wasn't enough, and eventually she was one of the many of hundreds of thousands of um you know heroin addicts who came up in the South Bronx and in Harlem in the uh in the 80s and um it never got better for her 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 addiction actually consumed her until she contracted AIDS through sharing intravenous uh needles and she eventually passed away my goodness, and where was your stepfather when she passed away? Did your stepfather then take care of you all? Well, my stepfather died first because he eventually, oh, okay. yeah, he eventually um, started using uh, heroin and contracted AIDS. I guess they, I don't know if they caught it around the same time, but I know he died two years before she did. Okay, so yes, yeah, so both of them were doing intravenous drugs. Mm-hmm. They could have contracted it, then they could have given it to each other. We don't know, but both of them wound up heroin addict, addicted and suffering from from AIDS and how were you all being raised under these circumstances like was your mom able to you know bathe you feed you you uh take you to school walk you to, was she able to read stories at night like what where was the what where was the normal parenting coming from in this situation well the thing about our, our growing up was 
abnormalcy was our norm. Mm. Um, I never knew that my mom had grew up in mental hospitals until, you know, years after she passed away. And, you know, I did research for a book that I was writing and, and you know, learned about her growing up. But um, being raised by heroin addicted parents in the 80s was there was there was nothing pleasant pleasant about it at all um one of the reasons why i took to the street because we got tired of of being hungry like my mom you know she had to have her fix and there was times she would take food out the cabinet and sell it like everything that came through the household you know a lot of it got sold for drugs and the kids were put on the back burner um after my brothers and sisters my oldest brother and my two twin sisters were up were born um they would you know eventually they were taken from her what well, because you know they were born in a hospital so they were put in foster care so um after my mom got out and she met my 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 dad my biological father she had two more children who was my sister sabrina and myself oh three i'm sorry three children my sister sabrina myself and my brother Janell. and then um he, my 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 dad died, and she met uh, Richard Steele, who, you know, she had a child with, um, who was my youngest brother, who eventually, at some point in his life, he was shot and killed um, on the streets of the Bronx, um, and our 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 upbringing was more than challenging. It was. It was, it was very hard. Yeah. Okay. So you're describing the situation where the things that most people or most children take for granted, just saying, "Mommy, I'm hungry." Like my kids are like every day. It's like, "Mommy, I'm hungry. Go make me this. Can you make me this? Can you make me that?" And having a mother and father who respond, who give them food, who read to them, who play with them. You didn't have this. Well, to a certain extent. Oh, tell me. Well, yeah. the the thing is, what. Kind, which which is kind of like ironic mm-hmm. was my mom was very intelligent great mm-hmm. um when it came to schoolwork there wasn't a subject that she couldn't help us on wow um whether it was math science social studies um she was well read and mm. i guess and i you know when i think back about it um, I guess from being spending a lot of time um, in an institution, she probably did nothing but read. Okay. Um, but like my handwriting, um, my school grades growing up, um, you know, reading uh, uh, ninth grade, you know, ninth grade reading level in the fourth grade. That that all came from her. She used wow. to really crack the whip when it came to us teaching. When despite it came to us addiction, learning, despite, despite her, her addiction, despite her addiction, yes. And despite the fact that she could, she was someone who could literally sell your food for money for heroin. She actually really instilled in you all the value of education. Yes, this is very, very interesting. So now tell us, how from this do you wind up incarcerated? Well, one, I got tired of being hungry, um, and I definitely um, was was more inclined to help my brothers and sisters because I was the oldest at the time, you know, in our household. And, you know, we used to, I remember sneaking out the bed and crawling to the kitchen to, uh, you know, grab a loaf of bread and, uh, um, you know, jar mayonnaise and making mayonnaise sandwiches. And uh, we used to call them wish sandwiches because we wish that they, there was something in between the bread other than mayonnaise. Wow. And uh, when I when I learned how to hustle, which eventually became my 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 business prowess, but when I we first learned how to hustle, I went out. I started packing bags in the supermarket for tips. Um, you know, back then, uh, you know, you 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 pack bags for a few hours, you make five ten dollars. Um, then I would go get some food. And bring you know, it to your siblings. Bring it to my siblings. And you all eat, yeah. And um, eventually one hustle led to another, and uh, I wind up 
uh, well, oh, I remember when crack cocaine was introduced to the South Bronx, and you know, in one sense, it was it was it was a blessing because you know there was this drug that was out there that people was buying in droves, and you know, I didn't use drugs at the time, and um. You know, when I got my hands on it, you know, I went from packing bags to packing crack vials and, you know, being able to put food on the table for my brothers and sisters. But, you know, eventually it's a criminal lifestyle. Um, I got caught up in it. Um, Things were very violent in our neighborhood back in the 80s. And I I wind up getting involved in a, a homicide to um, to the extent where I was charged with murder in the second degree, uh, criminal possession of a weapon, assault in the second degree. Um, went to trial, was tried, convicted. I was sentenced to 38 and a third to life. And um, one of the turning points in my life was when my mom found out that she had contracted AIDS. And she came to visit me in prison just once. And never wrote a letter to me, but she came to visit me when she found out she had AIDS just once. And she said to me, you know, um, your life isn't over. She said, I want you to make three promises to me. The first promise she promised me, she had me promise her that I was get that I would get as much education as I can while I was incarcerated. I had been a ninth grade dropout. Um, I used to go to the Wake Clinton High School. I um, was a graffiti writer. I was a break dancer. I was a rapper. Long before this stuff was ever commercialized and put on the radio, it was just our lifestyle. And um, you know, going into getting incarcerated at that time, a lot of kids who um, were you know caught up in the in the hip hop culture. A lot of people were incarcerated at the time, and it's it's one of the ways how we spread, uh, you know, the rapping and break dancing and and the culture to other boroughs was through the uh, prison, prison system. system. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was pretty popular back then. Um, so when my mom came to you know to see me, um. I was bitter. I was bitter. I was upset. I was upset with her for being who she was and, you know, not really understanding her full story. But, you know, like any child, you know, most children want the perfect parents. Most parents want the perfect child. But God doesn't deal with cards like that. You know, you you get the hand that you get and and you work with it. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't until... After she came to see me, when she had me uh, promise her that, one, I would get as much education as possible, two, that I would find my brothers and sisters that she had well, you know, while she was in the hospital and unify my family, and three was to find God, find the God in me, find the God for me, um, So while I was incarcerated, um, I studied religion. I went to school. Um, Again, like I said, I was a ninth grade dropout. I eventually got my GED. At the time, they had college. Um, I devoted myself to going to college um, and, and taking it serious, not just taking courses for the sake of doing something, but wanting to be the at the top of my class. Um. And I, I I loved business. I loved business since I learned how to how to how to make my own dime by packing bags. And at some point during the incarceration, business became such a passion that when they took away the college programs, I went and got a lot a, a a job in both the law library and general library and became self taught. I just read everything that I possibly could about business. And um, and so when you got out, you were determined to start your own business. I was absolutely determined. So now we, we don't have much time, but we have to find this out. So, well, two things I wanted you to ask to clarify. 
you were convicted of second degree murder, which most people think of first degree is murder with a cold heart, with, with, with wicked intention, while second degree is a mitigated offense because there isn't that premeditation. Mm -hmm. But in your case, you didn't actually pull any trigger, right? No, no, I didn't. What I, exactly did you do? I was um I was there. I was I was present. Um the the prosecutor uh painted the motive as a contract killing but it wasn't actually a contract killing somebody a rival street crew member had stole some material from us and made some threats against us and we went to talk to him uh, my co-defendant asked me to accompany him uh you know I, I went to to i went along with him you know we we had guns um everybody had guns back then and while we, while we were talking, it, they started arguing, and uh, gunfire erupted, and we were. And you were there. Yeah. And you were yeah. there. Wow. Okay. So now, your mom has this wish for you, and this. I mean, at the time, she wasn't on her deathbed, but to a certain extent, it was a lot. It was it the last time you saw her alive? Yeah, it was the last time that so I saw it her. It might alive. as well have been her dying wish <laughs> that you one make sure you get an education. Two. Uh, re reunite reunite the family by finding the children that she uh, gave birth to while in a mental institution, mm -hmm. and three to find God. So now mm -hmm. you you're released. How okay. exactly do you start a business? Well, the first thing I put in all these applications, and I came down to that question when it would all you know would always ask, "Were you convicted of a crime?" Initially, I I would check off no. Get interviewed, make an impression. My background would come back. They would just, and then would you, you know, they would they would tell me, listen, you're not getting any job. You lied on your application. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I started checking that, you know, I I I I was a convicted felon. Um, all the while, um, I had. Uh, started uh, volunteering at uh, at Print International. Um, then I wind up getting a job at uh, Franklin Square Ford. While I was at Ford, um, during my incarceration, I had learned about printing and commercial design and commercial arts. Um, so while I was at Ford, they asked me to help put together a, a marketing campaign. And, you know, I did a great job. I did, I created some flyers and banners, um, some brochures, came up with a, a marketing plan where we were going from church to church, giving credit repair seminars and, you, you know, how you can use a car to repair your credit. And I just kept coming up with different marketing campaigns and, and they were working for the for the dealership and you know then I extended extended the service and started um, doing small businesses in the neighborhood barbershops mm. beauty salons um, we were doing graphic design for them then eventually um, we started um, creating their branding packages and and it just went from and it there. Grew, it grew very organically. Our, mm -hmm. our time is ending, but uh, it grew organically. Mm -hmm. Basically, you started doing the work that you loved at a job. You did get a break. And, mm -hmm. and God bless you, Ford of Franklin Square, for hiring someone who was a felon and giving someone a chance. But you mm -hmm. did get a break, so we have to thank you know uh, God's intervention for that. And you did work that you loved for your company and then wound up extending it to small businesses in the area, and you grew from there. No, this is, this is an absolutely compelling story because what you're describing for many of us isn't a setback. It isn't like, oh, you made a mistake and you got set back. Um, to a certain extent, it was like you were born back. You yeah. were born back, not a setback. You were born back. You were born in a situation that was very challenging. But the beauty is that you say, even though there were all those challenges, your mom gave you so many gifts. Your mom gave you the gift of the value of education because she was a well-read, well-learned person. And then she gave you those three wishes and instilled them in, in you. And you literally changed your life around partially due to the fact that she had these hopes for you. And she expressed those hopes to you.
Yes, and that's that's one of the things that if I hadn't taken heed to the promises that she asked me to 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 fulfill for her, I wouldn't have became the man that 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 I became later on. Um, one thing about business, you really don't know how far you've come until you've stuck it out. You cannot give up. You have to define what it is that you want to do, learn how to do it, be willing to master your craft, get your team together, and push forward. Um, you can't deviate. Some people get tired and they want to, oh, I want to try this and I want to try that. Pinpoint on one thing that you're good at, learn your craft, master it. The business aspect comes. People are gonna pay you for what you know. If you know, if you know something and you're good at it, people will pay you for what you know. And I, I took time out to learn that business. I learned it in prison. I extended my 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 education by going to the library. Then I wind up taking college courses on the outside, entrepreneurial courses. And I, and I just stayed the course. And, you know, our company grew. Our company grew substantial. Just this Friday, we acquired uh, two sign-me-up franchise locations, one in One Talk, another in Hempstead. Um, we've we've been a part of films. and No, it's amazing. We, we Unfortunately, our time is coming to an end. end. Please tell our listeners how they can keep in touch with you quickly. Well, we're located at 250 Fulton in Hempstead, New York. Um, our website is www.employprinting.com. Um, you can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash employprinting. That's employprinting.com employprinting.com I thank you so much for your time this concludes how to make it in the city we are grateful for the expertise and experiences of life coach Winnie Benjamin and Click Clicks Media Group founder John Garland thank you so much for listening I am your host Ama Kari Kari Yawson Esquire, author of Sunaid's Gift please contact me for presentations my Email address is ama at wbai.org. Again, ama at wbai.org. You can also call me at 347-886-2026. Again, 347-886-2026. And please don't forget to support the uplifting work of this show and station by going to www.wbai.org and becoming a becoming a WBAI buddy. Thanks so much. Until next week, I'm wishing you all love, joy, health, peace, and prosperity. Be well, loved ones.